what's the book about? So Axwater John's about this ruthless killer. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, the movie Desperado. In, in Desperado, Danny Trejo was a character, and he was a knife thrower. And uh, Axwater John is something like that, but instead of the knives, he's covered in axes. Um, he's kind of this man that's on a kind of a dark path, and what happens is he comes across something, we'll call it uh, the catalyst in the story, uh, that quickly turns into the MacGuffin of the story, where he sees it as like, he's been this horrible, ruthless killer, and he's always done things selfishly, and something gets put in his path to where he sees it as an excuse to kill and be as ruthless as he's ever been, but something like the gods are telling him it's okay this time, and he has a good reason to kill, you know? So I was thinking about um, the book when I was coming up with it. Uh, at the time, my daughter was really sick, and we were in the NICU with her, and she had a bunch of medical problems. She was in critical condition, and we ended up living in the Ronald McDonald House for a few months. And when we were with her, she... Uh, you know, she was having all these medical problems and people would come up to me and be like, you know, give it over to God or um, they would say things like, you know, just trust the doctors. And there's a big part of me, you know, seeing all these families with sick kids uh, in the intensive care unit um, where I was like, you know, you're helpless, you know, in a sense. So what I would do at night whenever I would go watch my daughter is I'd pull my sketchbook out and I started drawing these characters. And uh, really, I, I realize now that I was probably just playing with my He-Man toys again. And I always think about drawing like it's a extension of playing with my toys as a kid. And by that, I mean when you take figures and you draw them, let's say like this guy here, um, he's, he's all shapes and form. And if this guy had joints, he could move and whenever I'm drawing I'm referencing stuff like this and, and essentially moving those around on a 2D piece of paper and moving the shapes around and I'm posing them just like I would when I was a kid I'm, t I'm like that was an extension of when I was doing that as a kid playing with toys it was really an extension of uh, my imagination right and so now I'm just doing that but it's on paper and, and since I've developed a little bit of a skill set to draw now I get to have the excuse as an adult to still play with my toys and so I guess like while I was dealing with all that I was reverting back to playing with my toys and my favorite toys were He-Man as a kid and I, I always wondered what it would be like if somebody like Jeff Darrow or Mobius or Quietly did a mature violent He-Man story and if you took it uh, very seriously and you made it as graphic and as heavy metal-esque as possible so during that time I would draw this character John and uh, we draw him uh, in the the saying in the book is that he falls in love with his precious skulls and uh, basically what 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 would happen if a guy lost his mind and fell in love with the heads of his many victims and uh, for him he's he's protecting their heads and he's going on this war path and he thinks he's doing it for um, all the right reasons and you'll have to read the comic book to see what that's all about. Um, but, uh, there was something about like people telling me, you know, give it over to other people where I want it to revert and say, you know, I want to fix it, but you, you, you couldn't fix it at the time, you know? So, uh, I could easily take that concept and, and put the scaffolding of that, that kind of like, um, dilemma and place it right on top of, a of this, you know, m mean barbarian who would say that I'm going to fix this myself. And who would say that uh, I'm going to go out and make things right, and um, you know, and and he's going to do it his way. And then the cool, the cool thing is, is what if he was a, what if he was an axe wielder? So he's going to chop everything up and fix the world, you know, and make it right. And so, um, you know, for him, he's this kind of vagabond scumbag who comes across something that says, "Oh, this is my reason to kill." You know, this is my reason to uh, protect these heads or whatever. And so he, he, he marches down, you know, probably the wrong path, um, but he won't learn that until later. And uh, he goes, you know, on a crazy war path to fight, basically to break all my old He-Man toys in half. 
And that's what the general story, the hook of the story is about. So yeah. Um, let's see, what's the next question I keep getting? Um, how long is the series? So the series is really cool. Uh, it's going to be, I want to do all my favorite artists like Arthur Adams or Frank Quietly. They're not the fastest guys in the world. And with Axel or John, I know I'm not going to be fast because I'm drawing every panel on its own 11 by 17 board. So like if you see back here, you can see that Lord Fane character back there. That's one panel. And it's really two, it's two boards. Um, it's two 11 by 17 boards um, taped together. And even like a panel like this here, and this is just an 11 by 14 board with one panel on it. Um, and so every board is like that. So I knew that I was going to, what I wanted to make was an evergreen story. And uh, I wanted to draw it in a way that you could always go back and look at it and it would look, you know, as, as top notch as I can physically make it or skillfully make it at this point in my career. So um, I like the idea that like an Art Adams annual would come out and with that Art Adams annual, you'd have one a year, but you would you would cherish those for forever. Those are, you know, evergreen stories for a lot of collectors. So I always like that idea so why wouldn't you have you know this is something i wish art adams would do uh even though i think he's he is one of the best if not the greatest uh, american comic book artist there is but he just does covers now but what if instead of doing those 20 covers he came out with a single issue every year and that issue was you know, the best issue that that could possibly be drawn and art adams could do that but instead he's making better money doing other things but what if every year he came out with a hardcover in an oversized hardcover. I think everyone would buy it all the time. And he pulled himself out of the monthly grind and just made the most high-end books that he can make. So that's something I always wanted uh, from other people. Like quietly, I would love if he would, if he would do that. Uh, I wish Mobius uh, would have done that. And he kind of did. Um, but but what if they played with the stuff that I liked, which was, you know, Barbarians and, and He-Man and all that stuff that's kind of childish, but, but brought it to an adult level, you know, not unlike Conan. So what if, um, with John, I really wanted to set out to do the book my way. And I knew a big part of that was do, completing the book and doing it all my own. So for the last year, I've just been kind of in a hole working and working on and, and building this book out and, and writing the story. So the length of the, the story is the first book is about 100 pages long with 40 pages of extras with a sketchbook in the back and a lot of pinups in the back, a lot of fan art in the back, some of the script in the back. So when I collect, I love oversized hardcovers. I love extra material. So with um, when, when I decided to make the book, I wanted to make it my way, which was going to be oversized uh, with all the extras in the back. So that, that's something that I had always hoped other people would do and I figured why can't I just do it so that's that's the length of the book right now it's one oversized hardcover for the pretty much the hook and the intro the middle of the book is kind of the meat of the story and then the last book will kind of round everything out so it's three oversized hardcovers over the next three years and then there's a generational jump if the book's a success where I can go with some of the, the you know, some of the younger characters or somebody you see a child who's the frame narrator when she gets older, there's another big, big story to tell, which would be two, uh, two books, you know, really, they're not one shots because they're graphic novels, but they're kind of self-contained. So the first, the first story is going to be three oversized hardcovers and the last two stories to round out John's entire tale when he's, after he's an old man and after the first arc, um, he'll go on a journey to like Valhalla or something those lines if he survives the first book and or maybe he breaks out of Bahala. we haven't you know i don't want to say exactly what he's going to do but it's really cool the stuff we have is really the stuff we have planned is really fun so um what's the next question uh what's the format kind of answered that already that's oversized hardcover and then what is zoop and i'll probably uh have a new video for what is zoop but the short answer for what is zoop which i get quite a bit it's a new crowdfunding platform, and Zoop basically um, does everything the other platforms do, only they also do the distribution. So when you go to them, they're going to make sure the books are shipped. Um, they're going to help you with printers. Really, everything that a creative person would want, they offer for a, you know, a little extra percent of the total. 
Um, and what I think fans should be excited for about this, I know it's a new platform and it's hard to pull out your credit card or whatever and you know put that information in when it was already in you know Indiegogo or it was already in Kickstarter. But but this platform, you know, all those all of those platforms have problems with people getting their books out on time. Rarely do you get your book on time. And a lot of times that's because people pitch it just as a concept or a half-finished book. But with Axe Mulder John, the book is going to be complete. We're almost done with it already. We have two months two months to go for me to finish drawing it. We only have about 20 pages left. So I've got to do about 10 more pages in the next two months. Or 10 more pages a month for the next two months. And when we launch, it'll be ready to go. Um, and then fans should feel really confident about getting their product because we're the only platform that has distribution in place. Uh, it's not something I'm going to have to research on my own. We've already done it. So the book is going to be lined up with a printer. It's not in, it's not stuff I've got to deal with because Zoop handles the printers. It's going to be high-end printing because they have access to all the best printers. All the guys, Jordan and Eric, have worked in the industry for a long time. And they've been um, exposed to all the different printers and all the different hassles and all the different problems. And they're... they're, they're company Zoot um, has already made jumped those hurdles before so those are hurdles that I don't have to jump as a creative person so fans should feel pretty confident that if the book is complete launching you know in a couple of months when it's almost ready to go already and have distribution printing and everything lined up they should feel more confident about getting their product which is always a, a thing when I back you know uh, crowdfunding campaigns I'm always worried about like because I, I've definitely backed some and not gotten the product before or backed some and not gotten it for a year or two after that, that date. So that was something with Zoop that really meant a lot to me or was a big deciding factor. And I had my chance to go with Kickstarter and they made a little mini pitch to me on why I should go there. And uh, maybe I'd make a huge mistake in not going with them. But I just think Zoop is a really cool place where uh, you could build something special. And I'll make a separate video about that. So.